Italy. Most of the furniture is purchased in Europe. You're going to see some random dressing screens in the rooms because Mrs. Overholzer would place dressing screens in front of the radiators. She did not like the way they looked. Uh -huh. Although hers were pretty uh -huh. ornate. Uh -huh. The curved ceilings enhance acoustics so like the music would flow from these rooms. Mm -hmm. But you also notice how petite the furniture is because that's yeah. probably very close to life size. You'll see their clothes upstairs. Her waist around is 20 inches. Oh, what, do you reckon that is a life size? Yeah. Um, Yes. Um, Sorry, no, should we say what you're not she was very tiny. Is. Her shoe size is a four. Yeah. The banister is only two and a half feet tall. The beds are oh, only yeah. 59 inches in length, so you can't get a regular mattress. This was built outside of town. This was the social hub of Oklahoma City because they were known for their lavish lifestyle, lavish parties. They had a son before their daughter was born, but he died at eight months back in 1891. The daughter is the one that lived here until she died in 1959. Built in 1903, costing a whopping 38,000 US dollars, equivalent to over a million dollars today per inflation calculator. The Henry Overhauser Mansion showcases the legacy of the Overhauser family and Oklahoma City history to this day. There's an additional 4,000 square foot carriage house, referred to as a detached garage today. The mansion, an 11,000 square foot, three-story French chateau style home, was built by Henry Overholsa, referred to as the father of Oklahoma City, and his wife, Anna, known as the prettiest woman in the territory. It was also the place of birth of their only daughter, Henry Lone, in 1905. Parking is on street, which was quite easy. Since it is in a lovely residential area filled with elaborate turn of the last century homes. Moments after we walked inside the house from the side entrance, we were transported back in time to a different era of early 20th century opulence. The home is elegant and all the items were gently used. We walked up the stairs hand in hand, just like Anna and Henry would do, going to their bedroom or maybe coming downstairs for breakfast. I don't know, just assuming. The smoking room where the gentlemen would gather after dinner for cigars and to discuss business. Across the hallway from the smoking room is the music room. It features a 1902 Kimball piano and an 1892 Regina music box with 60 discs. Next to the music room is the withdrawing room or parlor. This is where ladies would visit on an afternoon call. My second favorite room in the mansion. So pretty.
Across from the parlor is the receiving area. This is where a visitor would wait for the lady of the house, Mrs. Analon of a Horsa. There are two flights of stairs inside the house. The main staircase by the receiving area features the beautiful stained glass windows that the music ladies made in Kansas City, Missouri. Walking through the turret with window seat where musicians would be placed behind a bank of palms before you get to the bedrooms, two of Mrs. Anna Overholzer's dresses are on display. Like the docent said, Anna was very tiny with a 20 inch waist and the shoe size was a 4. My waist was 20 inches when I was in high school. I'm talking 40 years ago, okay? Walking through the hallways of the Overhalsa mansion, one journeys back in time, experiencing first-hand life as the Overhalsas did over 100 years ago. The carpets in the rooms and hallways are original and were imported from England. There are three bedrooms upstairs, two guest rooms and the main bedroom. The first guest room is the blue bedroom. The bed in this room is 59 inches in length, much shorter than a modern day bed. A bathroom connects to the next guest room with original claw foot tub and a round marble sink. Today, a 67 inch cast iron claw foot tub costs about $1,500. Trust me, I looked it up. I googled it. The second guest room is called the Monroney bedroom because Senator A.S. Mike Monroney would stay when in town from Washington, D.C. He was the Overhorse's son-in-law's best friend, David J. Perry. It is also the same bedroom that Mr. Overhorse used when he got sick until his death in 1915. Some people claim the ghost of Mrs. Overhorse still glides through the mansion. We did not witness that, so I don't know how far true that is. Across the hallway from the Manrani bedroom is my favorite room in the mansion, the master bedroom. Oh my god, this room is gorgeous. As you walk in to your right is a closet with special exhibit that features several pieces of their daughter's wardrobe, shoes, hats, and gowns. Don't mind that big stain that you see down there. Considering that this mansion is 118 years old, it's actually in a perfect condition. I think honestly, pictures and videos doesn't do it any justice. You have to see it yourself to actually appreciate the condition of this 118 year old mansion. I wish they could re rope this a little bit for deeper entry into the rooms. But anyway, we still got the feeling that we had been thoroughly immersed in the house. The master bedroom was redecorated in the early 1950s by Henry Lawn, the daughter. The carpet is made of chenille. This is where the ladies did their makeup. So cute, love it. Oh, and the ceiling is coming down up there. But the house still looks great, honestly. I mean, considering that it's more than 100 years, like I said earlier. There's a sitting room 
connected to the master bedroom. Wow. Guys, check out this. Isn't this amazing? This is gorgeous. The Victor television and the tables are from Italy. Ouch, very pretty. This room connects with the sewing room. I remember my mother had a similar sewing machine uh, back in the days. And this sewing room also connects with the nursery. This is actually the original nursery for their daughter, Henry Lawn. The overholster's first child was a boy who they named Henry Samuel. Unfortunately, he died as an infant at eight months old. They then had their daughter 15 years later and named her Henry Lon, who became Mrs. Henry Lon Perry. Hand painted canvas walls stained glass windows and lavish fixtures which accentuate the ideas in times of a prosperous Oklahoma City. The decor and the lifestyle of the rich family was a fascinating peek into old Oklahoma. We were left to wander through the entire place at our own pace. It's rare to tour an old home with its original furnishings, so this is a gem. The quarters for the governess on the third floor occupied the entire top space and the largest we've ever seen for a person in that position. It was larger than most people's homes. According to early suicide columns, children were sent to the third floor to play while their parents were entertained downstairs.
The kitchen was remodeled in 1966. This is the most modern room in the home. Although the kitchen is the most modern room in the home, we still found some old pieces. For example, this kettle, this is pretty old, antique, and uh, an iron. In Africa, we used that when I was growing up. I remember that very well. Then down here is a heater to keep home in winter. Then... I think this is a food processor. I'm not 100% sure. Then on top of this cabinet is a bread maker. We didn't know what it is until um, I noticed that it said bread maker right there. Then um, there's an old clock up there. Then an apron, maybe Mrs. Horses, maybe Henry Lawn, the daughter's apron. Then an old phone, I had to play with this phone because, you know, I hardly see this. I mean, I never experienced anything like this growing up. This is very, very old, an old phone. Then between the kitchen and the dining room, this cabinet full of plates and cutlery, utensils, chinaware, glasses, you name it. It's all in here. Oh my God. All the plates and glasses, wine glasses, whisk glasses, you name it. It's, it's there. Wow. And another old clock. Yep. This, we couldn't figure out what this was. We didn't real, um, we tried to figure it out, but we couldn't. Look like, I don't know, maybe that's where they did their laundry or something. I don't know. Maybe washing dishes or... Anyway, we didn't, we, we couldn't figure it out. I actually forgot to ask. I could have asked um, the lady that was showing us around initially, briefly. She showed us briefly. Then we walk into the dining room. Oh my God. What a beautiful dining room. Just look at the table and the, um, what do you call that one? Dresser. Beautiful, beautiful. Actually, um, this room is still being used by the society that manages the Overhouser's mansion. They still use it for meetings and things like that, from my understanding. Yeah, very beautiful. Very elegant, should I say. Elegant. Another elegant. I think this is my third favorite room in the mansion. It's the master bedroom is number one, then the parlor, then the dining room. Yes. So it says here the dining room is dedicated to the chart. Charing Dish Society board for its boundless commitment and energy in the preserving the Overhouser Mansion. We salute da, 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 you know the people who are involved. So those are the people who use the dining room now and again if they have meetings and stuff like that. Oh look at this. This is gorgeous, isn't it? Ooh, I would love to have this in my house. Beautiful. 
gorgeous lovely lovely items The house had almost all the original finishings and that enhances the visit. It has been updated to include AC, which is very nice in summer. Henry Lawn and her husband, David J. Perry, lived in the home and since they had no kids, Mr. Perry sold the home to the Oklahoma Historical Society in 1972. The sale included all the overhauls belongings, so everything in the home is original. The home is beautiful and in pretty good condition for a home constructed 118 years ago. Mrs. Overholzer had a wonderful taste all the way down to the intricate details. Tours are currently offered Tuesday to Saturday, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. It's $10 for adults. $7 for senior citizens, and children are $5. Go check it out. It's a very fascinating mansion to tour.